Okay. Well, we're back. Um, we've had a two week break. My name is Scott McCormick. This is the Articulate Bible Study on Fridays. And we're going to pick right back up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. We just finished up a conversation. Um, that's, that's not saying it right. We totally beat to death the horse that is the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. We covered it for like four weeks at least. Um, so we're going to take a running leap now to the end of chapter three. And uh, we're going to see a conversation now between John the Baptist and uh, some of his disciples. That's pretty revealing. Um, so we're going to be reading John chapter 3, verses 22, all the way through 36. And if the Lord is willing and the time allotted, we're going to get all that covered. Um, so that next week we can start on chapter 4. So how about, um, it's just the two of us. So how about Matt, if you'll read uh, um, the first half-ish, which is first two paragraphs. How about 22 through 30? And then I'll read 31 through 36. Then we'll get started. All right. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, Look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So let's do just a little bit of review geographically. Um, I'm going to draw my little Sea of Galilee up here in the corner. And then here's the Jordan River. And we started off with John the Baptist originally at Bethany on the Jordan River, put a B there. Uh, then we headed up into the land of Galilee. And in Galilee is a city called Cana, and that's where Jesus turned the water into wine. That was the first of his signs. Uh, we, we dropped down for a few days into Capernaum and then went to Jerusalem down here for the Passover. And it was in Jerusalem that Jesus meets Nicodemus, and they had this conversation we spent so much time talking about the last few weeks. So now it says in verse 22, after this, and that's, that, that doesn't mean he the very next day after his conversation with Nicodemus, but just after he had finished what he was there to do in Jerusalem, it says that he and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. And if you were reading like a King James, it would just say in Ju they went into Judea. Well, Jerusalem is in Judea. This, this region, this whole region here is Judea. And, and so this just means they went out of the big city, Jerusalem, and into the byways and, and the villages and, and nearby the rivers there in the countryside. And he remained there with them and was baptizing. Now, the way that's written, it sounds like it says Jesus was baptizing. Um, However, if we just scroll down a little bit in your Bible to chapter 4, let's read the first couple of verses there of chapter 4 to get a little bit of clarification. So, Matt, if you can read for me John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Sure. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Very good. 
So here we see that Jesus wasn't actually baptizing. It was his disciples. Uh, the disciples were baptizing. And why, why does it say Jesus was baptizing? This is one of those, well, they were there in representation of him. He was there teaching the people. He was calling them to God. He was telling them parables and stories. And that was his main ministry effort there. But those who were coming to him, becoming followers of him, as, as they were being baptized, that was being done by the disciples. But they were being baptized in Jesus' name. And so that's what it means thereby. He was with them and was baptized. Now, we're keeping with this theme of baptism, because then it goes on to say that John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. Now, remind me, which John is this? Is this John the evangelist who wrote this gospel, or is this John the baptizer? Which is a really leading question, because we're talking about <laughs> baptism. <laughs> this is John the Baptist. <laughs> John the Baptist. John is it John the Southern Baptist? <laughs> I I don't think that they quite formed no, yet that's at not that a time. Thing. It's a little. That's not a thing. We just call him the Baptist because he did a lot of baptizing, right? And that's what he even. This is what he keeps getting in trouble for is baptizing. Um, but here it says that he was uh, near a lot of water, and that people were coming to be baptized. And I wanna make, make a comment without starting a debate. Is that, can we do that? Um, <laughs> it's allowed. <laughs> it's allowed. So um, different denominations baptize differently. This is just a known thing, okay? And, and the, they, they each have their reasons for doing it. So I'm gonna to totally nix all of that, not important. I read one commentary that just looked at this one little passage and it said that, you know, there was plenty of water there. There was water here, water there. He could travel around and there was always water nearby where he could baptize people. And the point they were making was Israel is in a warm climate. You can get in the water there and take a bath and not get out so freezing cold you might die, right? That's just how they bathe. And so when they came to be baptized, they would get out there in the middle of the river and just dump down under it. That was just how they did it. And the point he was making, because the commentator that I read is a man who lived 150 years ago in Northern England, where several months of the year, it's way too cold for you to get in the river safely. You could die if you did that. And so the point he was making was, is immersion the only biblical way to be baptized? Because if that was the case, what about people in my day that live in this really cold climate? If somebody's saved, they're gonna be baptized, they might die. Is that required? That was the point he was trying to make. And I thought, no one's ever explained that to me that way before. Now, I go to a Baptist church. We baptize by immersion. You know, like he said, this is Israel. Every example we see in the Bible is by immersion. But I know that there's others, very faithful Christians, true believers, strong believers. They baptize in other ways, like um, what we like to call sprinkling. But I doubt y'all call it that, right? So, uh, I, so that's what we call it. And, and I agree okay. that it's not a, a salvation issue. Right, <laughs> I'm, not, right. I'm not ready to start so, a debate on it. <laughs> but, so I just wanted to bring it up here because there was a lot of water around there. It was a warm climate. They were baptizing. So that really more just gives us the setting of what we're talking about. Now, in verse 24, there's a parenthetical comment and that's important here. And we don't want to gloss over it. That comment is that John had not yet been put in prison. He is not yet in prison. And why does he, why does he say that? Why does he step back and remind us of that here? This is, a, this is one of those chronological comments. This is making sure we understand where we are in the history of Jesus's ministry. If we were to look at the synoptic gospels, which are uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are the synoptic gospels, um, meaning they're kind of the same, like sin, S-Y-N, this means they're kind of the same. They have a lot of the same content. Um, I, I heard one preacher say synoptic, like they give a synopsis, but that's, all the gospels give a synopsis. So that's not, it's, it's because they're very similar in content and structure. And 
each of them really starts the description of Jesus's ministry after John's been put in prison. He's baptized and then it's almost like we just skip everything until John's been in prison, and then, then we talk about what Jesus is doing again. And here, John has now come along, and his gospel is written probably 30-ish years later. And so rather than repeat a lot of the commonly known content of the synoptic gospels, he instead backfills a lot of the missing content from those gospels. So like the water turning into wine, so not included in the other Gospels. Other events that happened before John was put in prison, uh, John the Evangelist is including here. This is one of those stories. That's the whole point that we're making here. So um, John here is doing some backfilling uh, of things that just were not included in the other Gospels. So now, do, do you remember why John the Baptist was put in prison? why he was put in prison uh i couldn't tell you with certainty actually offhand he he made somebody really mad it was a guy named herod oh yes telling herod that no actually you shouldn't have your brother's wife yep yep that was it don't don't take your brother's wife that's um that's sort of a bad move and so john called <laughs> him out for it and when he called him out for it um I don't, I don't even think it was Herod who got really mad. It was Herodias, the wife that got really mad. And um, anyway, so they put John in prison and eventually he was beheaded. Um, so that's going to come back up again in, in this story. So John's not yet been put in prison and something happens. Now they're not too far apart. Jesus is baptizing not that far away. John is continuing to baptize. And in verse 25, it says, Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. So we've, we've, got, we've got John's disciples. Um, these are followers of John the Baptist versus a Jew. And the question is one of purification. And it's important for us to remember, we've been talking about baptism for the last four verses, four verses, three verses. And so that's the context here. When we talk about purification, it's likely they're talking about baptism. And this Jew here gets John's disciples all stirred up. And they come to John. It doesn't say the Jew came and came to John with a complaint. It says they came to John, the, the John's disciples, and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. And they're referring to Jesus. And so here we've got a Jew who is likely now a disciple of Jesus. Now, he's um, probably not one of the 12. He's not named here, but he is a follower of Christ. He's a disciple of Christ, um, and he's been baptized into Christ. He's been baptized um, in Jesus' name. And now he's having this discussion with John's disciples, and they are getting into this, will I follow Christ? Will I follow John? well, which one of us is right kind of thing. And I want to point out that it, that it calls him a Jew here. If we remember now, John's gospel is written later than the others. And it's written late enough that there is at that point in time, a distinction generally between Jews and Christians. So right at the beginning there, at the beginning of the book of Acts, for example, Jesus has, has uh, been crucified dead and buried, rise, rose, risen again, and he's ascended to heaven. Uh, the Holy Spirit's come at Pentecost, and uh, the, the New Testament church is formed. And where did they meet? In the temple. They were Jews. They met in the temple. It was sort of like just another Sunday school class at the temple called the followers of Jesus kind of thing. Well, it wasn't until later that they were all kicked out of the temple. It wasn't until later that they were called Christians which was a derogatory term at the time. You know, oh, you're one of those Christians, right? And that's actually become more of a derogatory term these days. So um, here, now that John is writing this some 30 years later, there is a distinction between Jew and Christian, and this is a Jew who has now come and is a follower of Christ. That's the point I wanted to make here, that this is still in that, he's describing a point in time that's in the past for him, 
but he's using words that he would be using in his contemporary language. This is a Jew who is now following Christ. And John's disciples come to John the Baptist, and they say, Rabbi, they're all worked up. He who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. Notice they don't call him Jesus. They don't say, you remember that guy Jesus of Nazareth? No, it, it, instead it's more like when my kids get in trouble and I'm really mad at them, and I go to my wife and say, your son is over there doing the wrong thing. He's doing what he's not supposed to do. Yeah, he's my son too, but I ain't call him that. No, that's your son, all right? That's, I'm not having anything to do with that. That's your son. And that's kind of like the language that John's disciples are using here. Hey, you remember that guy that you bore witness to? They're sort of laying the blame at John here. You do realize that all are going to him and he's baptized. Why are they worried about that? Well, these are John's disciples who didn't do what Andrew and John the evangelist did in John chapter 1. So we flip back to John chapter 1 and verse 35. Um, we've seen John already bear witness to who Christ is and who he is in relationship to Christ. And then we get to verse 35 of John chapter 1. It says, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and looked and as Jesus, uh, as Jesus, at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And then if you, you look down at verse 40, that was, one of those was Andrew, and the other one is not named, but it's very likely John here. Well, that's like the whole point of John's ministry, is to point people to Jesus. But these are disciples who've been listening to him teach about that constantly, and yet they didn't go to Jesus. They remained with John. And so they're worked up over the fact that there are other people, not just other people, all is how they put it. Everybody's going over there and becoming followers of Jesus. So their problem here is with popularity. Popularity or success. Now, if we were to look at modern day measures of church success, what do we do? Well, we start counting things like baptisms, and we count things like professions, and we count things like uh, but what, <laughs> what my old employer would call belly buttons and noses. You know, how many, how many fannies do we have in the seat, all right? We got attendance numbers, and we get worked up if the attendance numbers start dropping or if our giving numbers don't look good, and this is all based on popularity. These are, these are worldly measures of success that folks commonly do apply to churches, and that's what these guys are doing. Look over there. That guy, he's not you. We follow you, but you realize that he's becoming more popular than you? Even some of your disciples are going over there. Doesn't that bother you? Aren't, aren't you the guy we're supposed to be following? And John could have done, John could have done something really bad here. He could have said, yeah, you're right. We need to fix that. We need to change the way that we do our worship services. We need to start sending cards out to people to make sure they're coming to us instead of some other church. But we need to we need to make sure that people are looking at me. And he didn't say any of that. What does he say instead? Matt, can you reread for us verses 27 and 28? John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him but from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Very good. So there's two things here. One, he says, look, everything that I have has been given to me. In other words, if you look at my ministry and you see it as successful, that's not because I'm great. It's because that's been given to me. My role has been given to me. The skills that I have in preaching have been given to me. My understanding of scripture has been given to me. Even the people who have showed up to listen to me preach so I can baptize, that's all been given to me, and I can't receive it any other way. And so for, for me to glory in that would be glorying in the wrong thing. So that's point one. All of these things have been 
given to me. The other point that he makes here in verse 28 is, now you yourselves bear me witness. You yourselves need to remember and tell the truth. What did I teach you? I taught you I am not the Christ. Oh, I just cleared everything. He says, I am not the Christ. Let's get this back up here. We're not actually having class if Mr. Scott's name isn't up here in the corner. Talking about bringing glory to yourself. How about that? <laughs> um, he says, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. In other words, if you really are interested in following the popular, the important, the, the really special guy, you should have at least been paying attention to what I've been telling you. I've been pointing to Christ this whole time. That's who you're supposed to be going to. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to teach you as long as I can. And my finger is still going to be over there pointed to Christ because at some point you're going to go, oh, and now you're, then you're going to go follow him. So let's, let's just draw a little picture of that. Here, here's, here's John, and he's a really edgy pastor because he wears funky clothes. He's got on his camel hair, right, and his staff, and I can't draw locusts and honey. But here's, here's these disciples that have come to, to, to whine to him, and here's John, and he's pointing. That's a pointing finger, pointing stick figure. He's pointing over here to Jesus, and that's what he's always doing. That's his whole ministry is to point to Christ and to make sure they get that picture. He draws a word picture for them. He's good with parables. He's good with word pictures. And he's good, un, uh, unlike myself sometimes and many, many preachers that I've listened to, um, he, he doesn't draw really long word pictures that take up half the sermon either. This is a one-verse word picture that really nails it, okay? And it's a, it's a picture of a wedding. In verse 29, he says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So let's draw a groom. There's the bridegroom. and he, He's the bridegroom because he's got on his top hat like they have on top of cakes. And then here's the bride, and I will not do justice to her, her wedding gown, but she's got a veil, right, like that. And then look over here, not at the front of the room, not at the center of attention, this guy is the friend of the groom. This is the best man. But the best man in that day and time was not like our best man. Like I've been, I've been a best man and I had some things to do. I had to make a speech and um, you know, organize uh, certain events. The best man at that time had a critical role in a marriage. His job was, began by presenting the terms of marriage from the groom to the bride. Like he was involved in the proposal process. Then he was involved in the planning of the wedding. He inspected the bridal chambers. He inspected the wedding chamber where the wedding was to be performed. And if the bride and the groom got in a fight, that happens. His job was to mediate between the two. He's got a critical role. And yet, he's not the center of attention. It's not for him to receive the glory. Everybody in that room during a wedding ceremony is locked in on the bride and groom. And the best man, doesn't matter how close he stands to them, ain't nobody looking at him. He's not important. And so for him, the best thing is when he hears the groom's voice telling the bride how much he loves her and that he wants to marry her. Like, that, to him, that's the best part, is getting to hear the joy in that marriage ceremony. And that's how he sees himself. That's how John the Baptist is. That's my relationship here. Now, this marriage picture is not new. This isn't the first time a marriage has been brought up in Scripture. What Marriages are, are used as um, a picture of God's relationship with ancient Israel. You are my bride. I'm jealous for you. Um, and then they're used in the New Testament where the church is called the bride of Christ. And here he's pointing out Jesus as the groom. And so it's very easy for us to see this word picture where the bride there is the church and the groom is Jesus. And John's job is to make sure that gets matched up. 
And if that gets matched up, he is happy. And that's what he even goes on and says. He says, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Everything that I was expecting out of this relationship, I got it. I've been looking forward to this this whole time. And now I can point to Jesus and he's over there. And I can point people to him and say, behold, the Lamb of God. This joy of mine is now complete. So he, he makes a conclusion at the end of this story. In verse, can you reread for me? Reread verse 30 there. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. Their complaint to him was that Jesus was becoming more popular. And John concludes his little word picture by saying, he has to be more popular. This has to happen. So in relation to these two words right here, I heard a sermon one time about this passage. And the, the preacher told a story about a missionary. The missionary, this was a missionary who dedicated his life to translating the Bible into the native tongue of an unreached people. He went and lived his life among this tribe so that he could learn their native tongue and then translate the scriptures into a written copy of the Bible so that they could study it in their own language. Well, he got stuck on this verse. That native tongue, the tribe that he spent his life's work translating the Bible for, they didn't have words in their native tongue for increase and decrease. It, it, it's sort of like there's some languages that have no concept of the, the number zero. There's, that's just not a thing. Well, in this native tongue, they didn't have increase and decrease. So he was stuck on that for a long time. And then one time he was sitting with the chief of the tribe and they were talking about the affairs of the tribe. And the chief pointed over at his son and he said, now, you know, my son, right? And he says, yeah, I've met your son. He says, well, you know that when I uh, pass away, he is going to become the new chief. And, and he says, yeah, I get that. Yeah, that makes total sense. He says, that means that my son will set and his son will rise. And the, the missionary went, oh, that's it. That's the picture. That's increasing, decreasing. Here, here John the Baptist is saying, my son must set. My ministry is going to sunset. I, I'm going to work until I die on this. And he did. He died in service. He was arrested for proclaiming the truth and beheaded. And he died in service to the Lord. He could have retired after Jesus came on, uh, on the scene and said, hey, hey, guys, that, that guy was talking about Jesus. He's here. I'm going to head off. I'm going to retire. I'm going to go to Galilee and have a bunch of little John the Baptists and just live out my life. He didn't do that. He stuck it out in service and died in service. But there's this, if I was to draw a timeline, you know, here's where Jesus was born. And he, he grows uh, in stature and in favor among men. And then here John the Baptist comes on the scene, um, J for John the Baptist. And here John the Baptist ministry comes up like this. And then Jesus um, comes on the scene and is baptized. And so now Jesus's ministry is doing this number. And John the Baptist is going to do this, his ministry. And so he's saying, look, guys, I know that y'all are worked up about this. But you need to understand, Jesus's ministry must increase. His son is rising, and it's not going to stop. By the way, it's never stopped. He is still saving souls. Jesus is still sanctifying and redeeming a people for himself. Uh, he is still building his church. He is still on the throne. But John the Baptist is dead. Jesus is alive. John the Baptist is dead. So that's the, that's the picture he's trying to paint for them. This is something that must happen. Now, before we, go, before we go on, questions or comments on that? All right, hearing none. I have nothing. Yeah, that's good. In your Bible, at the end of verse 30, what is the last punctuation mark there? The last punctuation mark 
is the the full stop close quote close quote okay. but i do have what i suspect is the same footnote as you <laughs> i am also in the esv so yep so um that footnote number mine says number nine some interpreters hold that the quotation continues through verse 36. what does that mean that means that this this quote from john the baptist may mean that the whole next paragraph is also john the baptist talking it's because in the original text, there wasn't quotation that would have told us for sure that he had stopped talking. Um, that's similar to, for example, verses 16 through 21. Some say Jesus didn't say that part to Nicodemus, that it's John the evangelist commentary on what Jesus has been teaching and then explaining it in his words. Uh, although I, I think that it's, Mine's red letter, 16 through 21 is, is, is red letter in my Bible. So that, that says Jesus said it. But, that um, settles it. Yeah. That settles it. If it's printed in red, why are you, why are you whining about it? Um, <laughs> but here, 31 through 36 is, um, they kind of went either way. Why do I bring that up? Well, one is that kind of doesn't matter. Whether John the Baptist said it or John the Evangelist wrote it as commentary on the conversation between John and his disciples, the things in it are true, and they describe true things about Jesus. So this that's just a little textual criticism comment there. The quote may not stop there, but it doesn't matter. The things in it are still true. So here, let's reread verses 31 through 36. Um, can you reread those verses for me? Sure. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Good. So here... In the previous paragraph, John the Baptist has been comparing himself to Jesus and the, the greater importance of Jesus above himself. Here, that's repeated in a different way in, verses, in verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. Let me get my marker out instead of my eraser. And, and so it says that Jesus is from above or from heaven. These are two, two ways to say the same thing. Um, and that John is from the earth. And so he, the best he can do is to speak in an earthly way. But Jesus, who is above all, has come, and he bears witness to what he has seen and heard. By the way, he came from heaven. He's talking about spiritual things. He is an authority on these things. And then he makes a really interesting choice of phrase. He says, yet no one no one receives his testimony. Why is that problematic? Well, it's problematic because in the very next sentence, he says, whoever receives his testimony. Well, no one is absolutely nobody. Whoever means at least somebody. Which is it? Well, this isn't the first time we've seen this kind of sentence construction. So keep a finger in John chapter 3 and just flip back to John chapter 1 for a sec. In John chapter 1, um, this is in that prologue that we, that we started studying at the beginning of this series. Um, he's talking about the light which has come into the world. The true light was coming into the world. And then um, I'll just pick up in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and that's referring to the Jews. Jesus was born a Jew. His earthly ministry was to the Jews, but then ultimately to the Gentiles. And his own people did not receive him. Didn't. None of them. But to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So there's that no one, but then all those who did. All right. Well, some Jews did follow Christ. Nicodemus is one of those. He's, he's a Jew of Jews. He is a Pharisee, a leader in the Sanhedrin. He even comes to follow Jesus. Well, so we don't, we know that it wasn't none of them. 
this is a superlative way of talking. This is what we call hyperbole. Hyperbole is a way of saying, using language that's so high that we're just trying to raise up the significance of it. If we were to talk about all the people in the world who have ever heard the name of Jesus and what percentage of them actually believe on his name as a result, it's pretty small. And so it's as if to say, there are so few people that trust in him when presented with the gospel that it's almost no one who received him. It really is. It's almost no one. But don't let that be discouraging because those who do receive him, back in John chapter 3, it says, whoever, let me, let me find it, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. God has sent this man, Jesus, his only son, the eternal Logos, who became flesh and dwelt among us. And those who receive him are saying, yes, God is true. What God says about this man is true. What this man says about God is true. And I believe in that. But if you reject him, if you stiff arm the offer of the gospel, what you're doing is you're calling God a liar. But let every man be a liar. God is true. All right? That's like the definition of who God is. When he speaks, it's truth. So I want to finish with verse 36. We see here in verse 36 a... One of those, real, and John is so good at this, one of those one-sentence Gospels. Is it one sentence? One-verse Gospels. I'll say it that way. <laughs> one-verse Gospel. He says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is a lot like John 3.16. Just one verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is a lot like John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the salvation that's come. That eternal logos became flesh so that he could die. He was given up for our sins so that we would not perish. And then how is that? How do you take a hold of that? Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. And so we see a direct relationship. If you believe, the result of that is eternal life. But what is the opposite of believing that's listed in this verse? Does it say, whoever does not believe? What does it say? Whoever does not obey. Oh, oops. That means if you disobey... You do not see life. These two words are portrayed as opposites for two reasons. One is the, the very first act of obedience to Christ is to believe in the gospel. That's the first act. Believe, put your faith and trust in him, and you will be saved. He is the only name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. Belief in him is that first act of obedience. But on top of that, belief is not the same thing as saying, hey, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and, I, and he is my personal Lord and Savior, and bam, I nailed it. I got that fire insurance. I don't have to go to church anymore. You know, I, I got that Jesus is my Lord and Savior thing down. I can give that as a quick answer when Christians come and knock on my door, and I can live the way my, my life the way I want now. I don't have to work on that obedience stuff. That's called a profession of faith. That's saying you believe in Christ. That's not the same thing as a possession of faith. So when we go about counting professions, we got to remember there are many false professions. There are many people who say and may even believe that they have saving faith and they don't. There's a difference there. The way that we've been given to know or get a, at least a sign that what they profess is actually true in their life is that we would see fruit in their life, the fruit of the spirit. We would see righteousness increasing within them. We would see them repenting and turning away from sin daily. It's not an immediate thing. You don't, to come to Christ, you don't have to, you don't have to do all that stuff to become a better person and then put your faith in Christ. That's not how it works. You trust in Christ and then the Holy Spirit helps you every single day to put away sin and put on the new man. Here, 
if disobedience is just a part of who you are, it's very unlikely that you're believing in Christ in a saving way, that that faith isn't leading to works that are good. There's a difference there. We don't, get the, we don't want to get the cart before the horse. We don't want to say works equals righteousness. No, no, no. Faith produces within us good works and increasing righteousness. So if somebody comes along to you and says, look, you don't have to worry about that law stuff. We're under grace. You know, we all make mistakes. Whenever somebody's teaching a Bible study and they start calling sin a mistake, that's a very flippant attitude about something that's so bad, God sent his own son to die on a cross for it. Well, God doesn't think sin's a flippant thing, a nothing. God thinks sin is very serious. So obedience to him should be born out of my faith. It's, it's like saying, look, Jesus saved me. He rescued me out of the sin in my life. I am so grateful for him. I, I'm going to start studying my Bible and figure out what he likes. And I'm going to start doing that because I want to please him. He's my master now, and I love him. That's the kind of obedience that's talking about here. Make sense? Solid. Yep. Faith without works is dead, but works can't generate faith, yeah. <laughs> which is, I mean, it's a, it's a huge and an easy trap to fall into because as people, it, I think for everybody, it's so tempting to want to be able to do something to make up for yourself. Once you realize, if you realize that you are in sin or even if it's just between you and a friend and you, you realize you owe them something, you want to make it up to them and do something. And so it's so easy to latch on to things like this. Oh, see, I got to obey so that I can be righteous when it's just like you said, it's the exact opposite. It's faith without works is dead, but works is not going to get you anything. It doesn't earn anything. It's, Absolutely. Well, this wraps up chapter three. Believe it or not, we finished three whole chapters. Um, next week, we're going to see Jesus get into some controversial waters in his time and day. He's going to go on a road trip through Samaria. And a hint, Jews didn't go through Samaria. They went the long way around. So why does Jesus go through Samaria? We'll find out next time. Um, but... I've enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for leading, as always. Appreciate the, all the preparation and work that goes into it. Well, I, um, you know, I took a couple weeks break. That was needed. One of the things that I learned, uh, and, and you want to talk about glorying in yourself. I'll make a confession here. That's a big temptation point for me when I teach. Um, I try to be the best teacher and, and, and even if the word's coming out of my mouth, I'm trying to sound humble. A lot of times I take pride in that. And, and, I, and I'm trying to, well, I'm going to be so good at preaching this that it's going to rock people's minds. And God, God is over the, he was, by the way, that's part of why I got so exhausted. Um, and that's why when, over the last two weeks, God's been impressing on me through various situations that, his power is in this. It's not in my words. It's here. We're just going to spend time here and let the Holy Spirit do the work. And, um, you know, if, if I'm going to mess up, it's not a big deal. Um, I'm not saying make mistakes. I'm not, that's the point I just made. I'm saying <laughs> God works, God works through very poor tools. Every one of us is a very poor tool and he works through, through us regardless so i mean that's the point yeah then you can't take the credit yeah. god gets the glory that's still i identify with that but i i also know yeah you know, just having done guided studies in our bible study even just facilitating you know I've, i don't i've not done one from scratch but mm -hmm. just using materials and doing the research on your own to be ready for questions it's exhausting mm. and it's i agree super tempting to want it to go just perfectly <laughs> yeah but well we are past time so how about we pray and then we'll get back to work would you close us in prayer certainly 
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you again for this opportunity to study your word. We praise you for the freedom we have to do so. We praise you that you have given us such a valuable resource and that you have given us your spirit to understand it. For we know that on our own, our, our hearts are darkened and we would not be able to even understand what we are missing. Uh, we thank you that you have been so gracious to us. We thank you that you continue to provide for us even in uncertain times. And we pray that you will uh, continue to provide for your people as you always have done. And we ask you to open our eyes to the needs around us that we can meet in your name and grant us generous and cheerful hearts, ready and eager to help where we can and in doing so serve in your name and bring you glory and uh, proclaim your gospel in these ways. And we ask you uh, to do these things to your glory for we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for coming, Matt. Yeah. Thanks for leading. Uh, talk to you later. All right. Have a good one. Bye.